It's a beautiful night at the Lipedema Patient Roundtable sponsored by Lympha Press. I am the flapper, Brenda Viola, from the roaring 20s, the 2023s, <laughs> welcoming all of you to a night of encouragement and information. And you know what? I'm not going to do the introductions this morning, this evening. I'm going to have everybody do their own. Tell us about your costume and why you chose it. And let's start with Angelique Charles. Go for it. I am the witchy butterfly. Um, the inspiration actually came from Patty Cornute's uh, flyer that she made for us. I immediately said, oh man, I don't want to be a witch. And it reminded me of having seven whole years growing up with my mom of making me a witch. And one year I looked at her, I said, mom, I don't want to be a witch. And she said, I thought you liked this. So this is paying homage to my mom tonight. <laughs> I am the witchy butterfly. Thank you, Patty, for that wonderful idea too. Oh, and you executed it beautifully. Meanwhile, we're saying hello to all the awesome people that are logging on. Let us know you are in chat. I see April Sluter out there. She is saying, Patty, exclamation point. Let's talk about you. What do you got going on there, Patty? I am an OG Rhythm Nation, Janet Jackson from 1989. And I got totally inspired because it was a recent Peloton ride. And I had a whole outfit already lined up halfway created <laughs> and I switched at the last minute because growing up when you were picking what you're going to be for Halloween it was always this magical thing and I'm like oh my god this is just meant to be so uh so cool I Patty Cornu always brings the cool as does Susie Boshoff come on tell us about your get get up hi I missed you guys been a couple months anyway um, I am heartfelt, heartfelt condolences to you and grant on the loss of your mother-in-law thank mm. you um <laughs> my phone is off anyway i am a steampunk uh susie that's what i am beep 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 steampunk susie in the house yes, oh. i was almost moira from schitt's creek but I, oh, but I yeah. left my lab coat at the at the office. I was like, oh, um, man, so close. Love, love. Uh, so there's always next year. Jenny Bojean. Hello. <laughs> I, as you can tell, am a penguin. One of my neighbor's little children is really into penguins and suggested that I really ought to be one this year. So I thought, this will be good for several occasions, but I particularly liked it when I discovered I could make his wings flap. <laughs> I love, we love those ears. They're yeah. going to be probably the star of the show. The star of almost every Halloween show that we do is PGP, Cara Cruz. Please explain. <laughs> um. So I felt like this year wasn't as much surgery talk for me it was like here I am bouncing again on my bellicon so that is what I spent my lovely Friday night making was hand sewing <laughs> the mesh onto a wire frame to create my bellicon mat I love it <laughs> again once again I don't know if you ever quit your day job doing creative Halloween costumes could be your thing. <laughs> the, the, I love the comments too. Mm -hmm. And for those of you watching the replay, you can't see that people are saying Ms. Cornute, if you're nasty, you know, <laughs> all these different, and we have friends from down under. We have our, longtime friends that show up every month like Holly Hope and Angie Hampton and Mary Herzog. We're so glad to see you out there. Even one of our clinical experts fresh back from the Lipedema World Congress in Germany, Linda Ann Kahn, you even decided to dress up tonight. <laughs> so I'm just a Harley Davidson rider. My husband rode Harley Davidsons for years. At one time mm -hmm. we had five you know, not all Harleys, but in in our garage, I taught my granddaughter how to how to count <laughs> with all the things in the in the thing. So I'm a Harley Davidson rider. We want to hear 
so much about what happened in Germany. But before we go there, I've got to go to our other special guest, fresh from the National Lymphedema Network Conference, where she gave a seminar on Let's Talk About Sex. So that might come up tonight. Dr. Molly Slay, how are you? And we love your little, you know, what you, cute. It's supposed to be Minnie Mouse, but I think I, I've got my background blurred. I need to change yeah. it. Can you see the yeah. little glow? Yes. We see it. So, Minnie Molly, Minnie Molly Mouse, we thank you for joining us here. We've got so much to talk about. We know that you're going to have questions. Put any questions you might have in the QA. I see Susan O'Hara out there, and I also see Francine Schwartz and Barbara Schultz and Megan Fru. We hope you're doing well. We love, love, love all of you. Sorry that we can't mention everybody's name, or else we would take up the whole hour. But I want to first go to Linda Ann Kahn and ask you, Linda Ann, what was your biggest takeaway from the Congress in Germany? Well, that's a very loaded question because there were so many things. It was an absolute honor to be there and so, so exciting. I think what I the one talk that really talked to me was Dr. Michelini spoke about pregnenolone. And he, that's the precursor to all the hormones. It's the precursor to DHEA. And he said that that could be a key factor in lipedema treatment. So that was amazing. And then also just being with a lot of the people who are the researchers and I'm introduced to someone and, oh, my God, I've read your research. So it was really very, very exciting um, all of that. There were there were so many things. Um, Dr. Roxon spoke about the PF marker, but he also spoke about system clusters of symptoms that all relate to lipedema, like mm. thyroid and migraines and other symptoms as well. So, and then there were talks on pain. There were talks on the psychological aspects, nutrition. Well, interesting. And and one quick question to clarify does the pregnant please say that word for me pregnenolone does that mean more lipedema or less lipedema well he, he said the studies are continuing um let me just find the slide here no the studies will still continue but it's here he said you know it decreases as you, i'm going to read it because it was there a lot yeah, of please do when awesome you're pregnant, it, de it decreases as you age and when you're pregnant and it also decreases with resistance to stress and you need pregnenolone for improving physical and mental energy levels and nerve transmission it also reduces pain and inflammation and helps repair nerve damage promoting mood improvement and modulating sleep so he says that this there is often a low plasma level of pregnenolone in lipedema patients. Wow. Thank you so, so much think, for sharing that. Go I ahead. Think that's just phenomenal. Yeah, it is phenomenal. And also what's phenomenal is you're collaborating not just with yourself, but with a whole bunch of people, including our own Patty Cornute, Miss Cornute, if you're nasty, on a book. Tell us about the book. Oh, you want me to tell you? Okay. Yeah, so, and then so, Patty, jump in. Yeah, Lipedema Italia um, are writing a book on lipedema, and they've asked experts from all over to contribute chapters or different parts to it. So I've been asked, this woman listened to everybody. She listened to the Lymphopress talk. She listened to FDR. She'd heard me talk, and she knew specifically what she wanted me to write on. So um, it's going to be fabulous. Karen mm. Ashworth is doing a chapter, so is Karen Herbst, and I, and Patty Cornute. Patty, tell us about your chapter. Yeah, she reached out to me and said that it was kind of going to be geared towards people who maybe don't understand what lipedema is, and so writing from a patient point of view as to kind of how I got diagnosed and and that part of it. Really fabulous, and I think. That maybe even some of our, our attendees are also participating in this book. Certainly when it comes out, we'll do some fanfare here at the mm -hmm. round table and celebrate it because here's the thing that I got as a takeaway is lipedema is no longer a secret. 
it is in the forefront of some of the top medical minds. Yes, it is the target of this world conference. Any talk about it perhaps being virtually offered in the future so people who can't travel? No, we might want to lobby for that. It's going to be in Rome in two years' time. There were 500 people from 30 countries and patient representatives from 20 countries, all who had lipedema and then started their own focus groups, uh, different groups. It is that, yes, lipedema is worldwide. People know about it. We cannot wow. change the name like some people want to do. Mm. <laughs> I mean, if we finally got the name awareness it mm -hmm. wouldn't make sense to change it at this point. That's just branding 101. I actually look a little bit like Cruella DeVille, not like a, I'm looking at this and thinking, hmm. But anyhow, Dr. Molly Slay, it was great to see you in person at the National Lymphedema Network Conference. And you did a session called Let's Talk About Sex. I bet people attended just because that name is pretty darn compelling. Well, it was kind of funny because when I got asked to do the workshop, uh, a group email went out to everybody who they had asked to do a workshop. And they said, we want the workshops to be hands on. I thought, oh, <laughs> everyone's going to be signed up for this workshop especially if I have some real hotties that we have in the class. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it, it was really good. And it was just geared towards uh, providers on how to bring up the topic and speak about body image and sexuality with patients. So it, I, I felt good about it. It was fun. So should then this be a conversation that's happening when lipedema patients are going and talking to clinical professionals. Absolutely. I, I feel so, you know, the, the evidence tells us that women who have lipedema have higher levels of anxiety and depression uh, when compared to women without lipedema. Um, so, and we know that, you know, when one has anxiety or, de or depression, that can affect your sexual drive. It can affect um, not your ability more or less, but just you, you wanting to participate or you wanting to be intimate with other people. So mm -hmm. I do think that's something that really needs to be looked at and talked about more than it is. And while it's great when the medical professionals introduce the topic, how would you suggest that patients, and by the way, has anybody on the round table broached this topic with their medical professionals? And so how do we push this conversation forward? I think it depends on the particular issue that a person is having, you know, whether it's a, a, a physical functioning issue, if it's an issue with intimacy, I think the question has to be asked why, you know, are there body image issues and really kind of uh, addressing those issues on a level that maybe the provider can address them, but if not referring um, the patient on to a mental health care professional if that's needed, or if there's pelvic floor dysfunction, making sure that that person is working with a, a skilled physical therapist who is certified uh, in pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, yeah, so I, I think wow. it, it needs to be talked about more because I, I think it's a topic that's ignored and you know, patients don't bring it up and it's kind of awkward and there's different models of conversations to follow, you know, based in the literature, you know, providers don't feel comfortable bringing it up. Patients don't always feel comfortable bringing it up. So we just have to get used to having this dialogue in order to address whatever the specific issue is. Mm -hmm. I love some of the comments about we're bringing, well, big girls, Mae West said it, Big girls are sexy too. And actually, what is sexy? You know, what is sex? I would ask everybody. Because I, for my 60th birthday, someone wrote me a poem, I'm bringing 60 back, based on the song, I'm bringing sexy back. I want to know what you all think sexy is. And I want to hear about it in the conversation too, in chat. What is sexy? I feel that an energy that is love is the sexiest thing on earth. So I'll just start there. Anybody else want to jump in? What about you, Jenny? What do you think? 
confidence. I think I think when I have confidence in who I am, it exudes and it it attracts more people to me, if you will. Mm. You know, versus being somebody shrinking violet. When I'm confident in who I am and just what I'm doing, it mm. seems to come through a little more. That's so good. I love kindness, confidence, warmth, hugs. <clears throat> Casey Grovener, we love you in chat. We love you, period. It's wonderful. Uh, Susan O'Hara said, sexy is chore play. C-H-O-R-E-P-L-A-Y. Yeah, having someone do chores, that would be really oh. sexy. Oh. Patty, you just posted about your wedding anniversary. How many years has it been? 23. 23 years. How do you keep it sexy? <laughs> it's challenging, right? You've got a daughter who just turned 19 and we're just now since June home alone, just the two of us. And uh, yeah, lots going on in family dynamics. So it's making sure to connect with each other. And mm -hmm. the thing that really just stands out amongst everything is he's still my best friend I still mm -hmm. he's the first person I want to tell something to and he's the first person I turn to when I'm just done and I need I need to be held and you know it's it's making sure that you give that person the attention that they deserve and that can be challenging when you're running a group of 12,000 members wow. so I really try to focus on when we are home alone at night, I try not to be on my phone. I try not to be answering calls and questions, you know, from the group. And sometimes it's really challenging because I care so much about them. And it's, it's important for you to make sure that he understands that he's still number one. Oh, beautifully said. Thank you for, I know I put you on the spot with that, but man, that was a great answer. I love it. Of course, Michael in chat is saying sexy is Angelique. So we know how he feels about that. But Angelique, what would you say to that? And we'll get back to the clinical stuff, but inquiring minds want to know. Well, as an unmarried woman, <laughs> I'm going to say that the relationship that Patty and Bob have is sexy as heck. The relationship that Susie and her husband have is sexy as heck. Um, the fact, and Linda Ann Kahn and her husband as well. The fact that these people have triumphed through hard times, through good times, through medical challenges, through death, the fact that they still choose to come back to each other 20 plus, even more than that for Linda Ann Kahn years later, um, that is sexiness and that is the sexiness that I hope to one day attain with Michael. Thank you, Michael. Ooh, okay. Now, you know, I've got to go to my <laughs> PGP, which by the way, PGP made bracelets you know taylor swift makes friendship bracelets but so does pgp so i i thank you for your kindness kara behind the rebounder there can you please <laughs> share with us the idea of what sexy is and then i want to go into lipedema math which was a great post you did earlier this month <laughs> so i feel that like what is sexy changes throughout the course of your life and you don't realize that like as a young teenager you focus more on looks and all of that but right now for me as someone who's like incredibly busy with like way too much stuff on my it's my own doing and who has been going through such a different health journey that somebody who says I'm proud of you or I see all the work you've done. Don't downplay surgery as nothing you did. Cause like I was saying, like, I just went to sleep and I woke up. Like, and he was like, no, like you put work to get to that. You put work into recovery and I'm proud of you. I see what you've done. And then mm. also like, if I text and I'm like, today has been awful. And I get a voice note that's like, what's wrong? Talk to me. Mm -hmm. Like, wanting to hear what's wrong and not just like, well, my day was bad too. Like, you know, like acknowledging that like, okay, what's wrong? Talk to me. Like that's been a huge kind of like 
okay, <laughs> this is different. This is yeah. it's making you feel important and validated, yeah. right? That's sexy as hell. Yeah, yes. it's more than just like, I, I think for the longest time I've been approached as I like your hips, I like your curves. And I'm like, I get that men are visual, but to have somebody that, I mean, he still talks about that too. Don't get me wrong, but like to have somebody that also sees like the human, not just the like shell has mm. been like a huge difference. I love that you shared that. And I, I feel like for those who don't have a partner or even those who do, and I forgive me, but I, I look forward to these monthly roundtables because I feel like I get all that love juju that maybe I don't have in a relationship, but it really does help me to need. So I know we're talking about sexy, but filling that deep need inside, that's what the roundtables were all created for anyhow. So talk about lipedema math. So, I mean, we've all, I mean, if you're on social media at all lately, you've seen the girl math, boy math, ADHD math, corporate math, like all the different, you know, talks about how things math differently. And there is a definite lipedema math. I have been saying that for years and, um, you know, it's, that's why I don't focus on the scale because they took. 42 inches of skin off that weighed 20 pounds for my tummy tuck and the scale went down one pound. Like how does that, how? And like, I thought like, you know, okay, I was still kind of post-op. There was still some swelling. So there's fluid, but there wasn't 20 pounds of fluid on me that like this or 19 pounds that the scale only went down one because I wear my compression regularly. <laughs> I do the pumping. I like, you know, I make sure that fluid after surgery is out as quick as I can get it. So I knew that like, that wasn't it. And it still has not gone down anymore. I mean, I've had, I've had two, I've had three more surgeries since the tummy tuck and it's gone down. Like, I think another five pounds total, but like, it's gone down, I would say like 50 some pounds overall. And, but I'm down tons of inches, like 10 inches around like my hips and thighs in the lowest, like in the largest spot. And it's like insane because like, I still weigh over 300 pounds. And if you talk to any doctor, they would not touch me now after seven surgeries because my BMI is still what they consider too high. And I get it to a degree and I don't necessarily blame the surgeons because the medical community doesn't back them to be able mm. to do the larger surgeries because mm. if something would go wrong, there might not be an MRI or a CAT scan large enough at the local hospital to take that patient to figure out what the complication is. So until the medical community gets on board with larger size equipment, it's not really the surgeon's fault. That's kind of my view. Um, I, it's a little side rant, sorry. But <laughs> no, I'm so grateful you shared that. And it really is shocking because the math doesn't add up. One of no. our guests in chat said she had 28 pounds of saddlebags taken off of her body, and yet she weighed exactly the same yeah. after it, surgery. It does not make sense. Linda, Ann, like, is there any way to explain this? Well, one thing I do want to say that came out of the conference is that they said they uh, we know BMI is not an indication, but it came up over and over again waist to hip ratio is what they want and waist to height ratio <laughs> so but the reason for not losing that i don't know i mean there's just so much fluid 
even though some people say there's no fluid in, in lipedema, but there's just so much fluid and maybe the fat weighs more. It, it's hard to imagine, but we know that BMI is, is no good. They also said that the stages are not helpful because it doesn't equate to the severity of the symptoms. Yeah, Dr. Damey has been saying that for a while, that like, you know, stage one can be, you know, extremely painful for somebody and somebody stage four cannot have as much pain. I think too, a lot of stage four people don't necessarily realize that the pain they're having is lipedema pain. I think they're just, it's life to them because I didn't realize some of the pain and stuff I was dealing with was lipedema related until I started having the surgeries. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this doesn't hurt anymore. <laughs> okay. Um, but with the whole like hip to height ratio, I am as round as I am tall. So <laughs> I don't know what that equals, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So, and when we talk about, and we have a lot of new names and we welcome you to the round table. This is a safe place where we only want to uplift and make you feel good. We know that unfortunately, sometimes you are gaslit out there and you are judged. This is a no judgment zone. Some people choose surgery. Some people choose not to do surgery. However, you choose to manage your condition we just want you to feel supported. But I will say with this aching, which is the pain many people associate with lipedema, many people have experienced relief from that aching with the lympha press. So I just wanted to mention that if any of you want more information about lympha press, who are our generous sponsors for this every month, feel free to reach out, go to the website lymphapress.com. Because people experience relief and that's what we want for you. We want you to get back to quality of life and get back to relief. So Molly, aside from your session at the NLN, what struck you? I mean, there were some groundbreaking presentations. Dr. Chen talked about the lymphatics of the brain and how you could connect the dots to Parkinson's and other diseases, even Alzheimer's. So what was your big takeaway? Because I know I was actually crying at the end of his presentation to see okay. results from a man in China who they dealt with the lymphatics in the brain. And next thing you know, he could recognize his son again and sing again, which was a huge breakthrough. I mean, amazing. But uh, what about you? What touched your heart at NLN? There were so many things. I think uh, one of the, the talks that was super interesting, well, several of them uh, were patient stories, um, patients who had lipedema and primary lymphedema who were found to have central lymphatic dysfunction, which is not something that we've really talked about a whole lot. It was just fascinating. And I felt that central lymphatic dysfunction really should not be overlooked. If mm. there's a patient that presents or someone who presents with suddenly increased pain or more swelling, um, swelling around the neck, there were all these different things to look for. Um, and I, I think that's going to be something that's kind of up coming in the horizon. Um, that will be looked at or delved into a little bit more. Um, and Dr. Chen's presentation was just amazing. He uh, presented a case study. There's actually a surgeon, I think it was in China, wasn't it, Brenda? Mm -hmm. The Chinese surgeon um, who has been uh, using surgical intervention on patients that have uh, neurological dysfunction in their brains. And there was um, some video and some pictures that Dr. Jen Dr. Chen presented of this man who was totally bedridden and they did lymphatic surgery at the neck. And within several months, he was talking, he was walking. I, it was just, it was amazing. I couldn't believe it. Wow. It was, you know, and again, to have this sense that these amazing medical minds are looking for answers. We had a question in chat. What is, what are the central lymphatics? 
Can you help explain that for our audience? Sure. So we have a, a, a superficial and a, and a deeper lymphatic system. Um, and it's the right, it's the thoracic and the lymphatic ducts. And the whole right side of your body typically drains to, correct me if I'm wrong, Linda, I always get them mixed up. Right lymphatic, left thoracic, is that right? Does that sound right? Okay. And so your lower extremities and the upper left portion of your body drains to the lymphatic duct and they're deep, deep inside and they drain the organs in different parts of your body. And they're finding that if one of those ducts is congested, uh, for lack of a better term, that that can cause all of these generalized symptoms throughout your body. And there was a, a um, a speaker, I'm sure you've all, you've all heard of her who has lipedema and she was actually found to have a, um, central lymphatic, um, dysfunction. Her central lymphatics were not working properly, which resulted in a sudden onset of, of symptoms, shortness of breath. So I guess the question will be in the future, is there a relationship between central lymphatic dysfunction and mm -hmm. lipedema or primary lymphedema? Time will tell. I don't know. We'll see. Wow. It was did, did they talk about chylothorax at all in connection with that? I don't think so. So tell us what that is, Linda Ann. Yeah. Oh, well, chylothorax, usually it occurs in children, but I had a patient who had a had primary lymphedema and her lungs started filling up. And so the, the chyle is actually formed in the small intestine. And what happens sometimes that chyle can come up and come all the way up to the thoracic duct and gets clogged. And so they do surgeries for that. Um, so I just, it seemed like more, that was more central, you know. Uh, so I wasn't at that lecture on central lymphatics. I've been reading some of the comments and it sounds amazing. Mm. But I also wanted to talk about the brain because it was maybe six years ago that with the scientists discovered that we have this glial lymphatic system in our brain and it's around the dura mater of the brain. And up until that point, we knew that there was drainage, but we were told that it was pre-lymph that it came from the brain through um, into your, the soft palate of your mouth. So when we had to work on issues to do with the head, we would work in the mouth. But now we know that there is this glial lymphatic system. And when they discovered that, they did say that there would be hope for patients with neurological diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. So mm -hmm. I, I think Dr. Chen is really on the cutting edge. Literally. He is on the cutting edge of it And all. I do a lot more work on the head since we mm -hmm. discovered that about the lymphatics in the brain. I do a lot more lymph massage on the head with my patients. Can we do anything ourselves? Yeah, of course. But I got a hat on. I can't show you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I've got a wig on. But you can. I, I know it's shocking, but this is not my real hair. But oh. honestly... When I, so many of you may know, I was in a car accident this last month and I have been dealing with inflammation all over my body and I feel foggy in my head. And I think we all deal with inflammation. So is there any, like just simply just doing that is helpful? Yes, yes, yes absolutely. Well, you would first open like we always do you open at the clavicle over here. And then the the the, brain, the head, there's a line over there and it drains down this way. And it goes behind the ear, behind the mastoid process, and then drains all the way down to your clavicle. So you can actually, I'll just take this hat off. You can massage this way and then going down all the way down and all the way down until you come here. And then the back of your head, you massage down there as well till you get to the, the back where the, there's that little indentation. So, yes, you can do that. That will help. 
Because I loved what you showed us at FDRS about the vagus nerve and how to work with that. So thank you. I'm going to be doing some of that stuff. I really like that. Do all of you employ self-massage in your practice? So every I see nodding. Susie, tell me about you. What do you do? Um, I do a variety of things. I mean, obviously dry brushing, but then I also do, I have a, uh, like a lipo roller and I also have um, one of the Theraguns that I got as well, mm-hmm. especially post-surgically. So I've learned about opening up all of my little places and then moving everything to the right place. It's really a science, but it doesn't take that long once you get a routine. And um, yeah, I want to get a Bellicon soon to also help with moving. And then I have the whole body vibration plate that I use as well. Uh, Which, you know, when you say Bellicon, I said, now it's so funny because I can't see PGP's face, but I saw a little finger (laughs) pointing up. Please speak, PGP. So I have a 5% off code that would help you guys right now to Halloween. However, I have been advised that they're supposed to have a really good Black Friday sale coming up, which I will have a code for then as well. So keep an eye out because it's supposed to be one of their best sales for Black Friday. Ooh. So keep that in mind. I need to know. So follow PGP oh. at, at Pale Ginger Pear on Instagram, and you can see when those special offers are. We've got some clinical questions in chat I want to get through real quick. Does anybody know if it's common for lipedema patients to have high CRP? Angie Hampton wants to know. Go for it, Linda. It's C-reactive protein, and it is one of the inflammatory markers. And it's supposed to be 0.5, 1, or 2, but some of my patients are 25 and 35, and I do have Um, a patient who went down from 35 to 25 with an anti-inflammatory diet and then went on a plant-based diet and is down to five. So it is C-reactive protein. It is an inflammatory marker. We don't have any diagnostic tests. They were talking about this a lot at the conference, but that is one we can look at inflammatory markers. But for the future, we need more diagnostic tests Mm. that's one of the problems you know we don't know with lipidem it's clinical diagnosis Mm -hmm. okay what and now someone wanted clarity bailey maddox we're so glad that you're with us tonight can you expand on what you mean by lymphatic massage is that different from mlmd or mld i think is what they meant to say well we call it mld but i know there are different terms manual lymph drainage The colloquialism has been lymph massage. When I was in school, we called it manual lymph drainage, but it's all the same. It's all the same. Okay. As long as it's done by a CLT who's trained properly, right, Molly? Correct. (laughs) Trained properly is the key word. And I will say that um, I've had patients come see me recently who have been um, elsewhere to get treatment. And, and this is one of the things that were taught was talked about actually at the NLN was is MLD appropriate for lipedema? Okay. That so I, know where that, I know where that came from. Versus heavier manual techniques. Oh, I see what you're saying, but they also saying that because there's a camp of school saying that there's no edema in lipedema. So the manual lymph drainage doesn't help at all. But then there's the other aspect that we do MLD, but we must do deeper techniques as well, especially on fibrotic areas. So that's two different things. Right. I've always thought, you know, and that was one of the debates at the conference, should it should therapists be doing MLD with lipedema patients? And I say yes. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it kind of made my blood pressure go up a little bit mm-hmm. <laughs> when it was suggested that it's not useful because it is. Yes. And if it helps to decrease pain, if it helps to move lymphatic fluid, why is that not appropriate? I completely think it is. Because they're saying that there is no edema. That's why that those right. people are saying that. I know I've I heard in at the AVLS in Florida a few weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. I'm sure you did hear that. <laughs> but imaging studies tell us otherwise, right, Linda Ann? Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. So does the scale. They're using MRI more and they're using ultrasound more. But the problem is with all of the, especially with the ultrasound and some of the diagnostic tests, that it's not standardized. So one person could look at it, you'd get one interpretation and then another. So it's one of the things that the LWA wants to do is to standardize a lot of this. We have a lot of work to do. I'm a founding member of the LWA. So we've had lots of questionnaires and to just look at all these issues and, and bring out a proper statement and then move forward on that. So the LWA, how can we support it as patients or as people who are just interested in pushing forward the cause of lipedema? Well, you can join. There is a website that's live now and you can become a member of the Lipedema World Alliance. Hmm. Lipedema World Alliance. So that might be a new name yeah. to some of Linda, Linda Ann, when I went and looked last week, they were only letting uh, uh, groups, not individuals join. Oh, okay. They did have patient representatives at the conference. So you might be yep. right. Yeah. That'll but they were right. from, yeah, from recognized groups. And it was, it was yeah. kind of disappointing because I so wanted to join. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We had um, a representative from the FDRS. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Yeah. In fact, we are hoping to have someone from FDRS join us at an upcoming roundtable. And we've also put a request into Lipedema Foundation to have some other representatives. We were so fortunate to have Guy Eakin with us early in the year. But now there's so many advances happening. We want to keep inviting the guests that you care about to the roundtable every month. A few more questions uh, clinically. Megan Fru, who we just love. Let's just send a lot of love to Megan Fru right now. You feeling it, Megan? Because you were sending it. She wants to know, do any of you have digestive issues? She has had some issues when she was first diagnosed with lipedema, lipolymphedema. Now that she has long COVID, it's every day unrelenting. The best vegetables, unfortunately, bother her the most. She's working with a nutritionist to explore options soon. But she's just curious, is anyone else dealing with digestive problems and wondering if this could be mast cell related? So who wants to talk first? Jenny. I, so I will say, you know, I was always somebody until my diagnosis thought, oh, I can eat anything. You know, there were like two things on my don't eat list. And then I started kind of figuring things out and um, found the food and sensitivities group and really figured out that my gut reacts to a lot of things. And I've kind of dramatically changed how I eat over the past few years. And I'll, there are very few, few fruits I can eat. And uh, veggies, I'm a little better on, but there are definitely some that I can't go near anymore, like um, uh, uh, pep peppers, you know, and tomatoes. I miss tomatoes. Um, but then it was really startling for me to figure out that hummus that I ate every day mm -hmm. when I took chickpeas out made a huge difference um, to my digestive situations. And I, I agree. I've never been diagnosed. I've not sought a diagnosis of mast cell uh, activation syndrome, but everything that I read about it, I definitely think I have um, a leaning towards it, but there's so many egregious things with that that I think what I go through is mild and that I can control it by switching my diet up has been helpful. Very, thank you for sharing that, Jenny. I appreciate it. Susie. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I have digestive issues, but I also have other, I, I have Ehlers-Danlos and that's known. And I also have, uh, I don't know if you call it chronic Lyme or whatever. Um, but for me, and then there, there was, something with like beginning stages of Crohn's ish, some kind of whatever. So most vegetables I can't tolerate. I think it's really something that, that is, is good to check it out and see for yourself what your body responds to and reacts to. I can't have spices from Mexican food, which makes me the saddest in the world. Cause I love Mexican food but it's a total no. I can't have any kind of spaghetti sauces and it doesn't matter if they have no sugar and I can't have sugar and I can't have, there's so many things that I can't have. Although I will say that my mass 
cell response has chilled out probably 50% since my surgeries, maybe even more. So that's very interesting. But I predominantly, I eat very few vegetables now. Um, I used to eat a lot of spinach and kale and it really, uh, I think the oxalates just trashed me. So I don't. And it's very, but you know, each person has to find what works for them. I'm so glad you said that because it really is true. What might be a trigger for you might not be for someone else. We know PGP, you have gluten issues. So certainly that's where digestion comes into play, correct? Yeah. So I also have celiac disease, so I have to avoid gluten. Um, And I've been doing that for 14 years. I actually figured that out before the lipedema stuff. Um, But I have been having, or I was having um, some digestive issues where I even went to the hospital for it um, because I would take a bite of something and then be like in so much pain Mm. that I would have the heating pad without its cover on, which you shouldn't do, um, Mm. against my skin to get it as hot as possible to try to like help Mm. the area in my lower back that was hurting and would like beg my son to like, stand in that like stand on that spot because it was hurting so bad and I tried to ignore that at first because that's what I do and then I finally went to the hospital when I started like throwing up as well because I first thought it might have been like diverticulitis Mm -hmm. um, because my dad had that and it was on my left side and everything and my local hospital was useless the guy uh running the er spot of it as soon as he saw me and saw that it was like stomach related he was just like well don't eat spicy foods and eat less and i was like i don't think one bite of like a breakfast casserole which was potatoes eggs and like sausage was too much or spicy because i don't like spicy and like the nurse ended up apologizing and basically said he was an asshole, but like I had to beg for a scan Mm. and he basically then just came back from the scan hours later and was like, yep, just follow up with like an allergist or something. There's something on the scan. And then I found out a month later at my pre-op for my next surgery that there was a mass on my adrenal gland in the spot that I was saying was hurting on my lower left back, which is where your adrenal glands, like with the kidney and stuff like are. And they never told, and he did not tell me that showed up on the scan from the ER. The Mm. doctor that was looking at the clearance for surgery was deep diving because she was convinced something else was wrong besides just lipedema. And she came across it and I had to jump through hoops of doing other testing before they would clear me for surgery because my adrenal gland might have not been working properly, which being the smart ass, I was like, maybe that's why surgeries aren't that rough for me. I have extra adrenaline. And she just gave me a look. <laughs> but- which, which the visual in your screen right now, this jumping through hoops thing, this is, this <laughs> actually is a good picture. And, you know, we just want to recognize that so many of you out there have to jump through hoops all the time and be tenacious and be your own advocates. Some of you are fortunate. I was fortunate this week to interview a lipedema patient, and that will soon be posted on the LymphoPress channels, Melissa Daly, who her very first visit was with Dr. Lindy McCutchinson in North Carolina. And she, boom, diagnosed, boom, treatment plan, boom, management tools. We applaud what's happening at Carolina Vein Center and how people aren't having to jump through hoops to get the help that they need. I see that Melissa is actually in our audience and we applaud you and we're excited about the journey that you are on, Melissa. She said that Lipedema, getting finally diagnosed, getting a diagnosis was the cherry on top of her life to realize, oh, this is what's been going on in my legs. She said, but the silver lining has been the people that I have met 
and the round tables. And I think that those are the silver linings that we all appreciate every month, especially when we gather. Patty, you are fiercely a mama bear with your people <laughs> and protecting them from negativity and also guarding the space that you hold at Lipedema Fitness. Uh, what is it? What is this silver lining of support? Oh my God, not feeling like you're alone just is so empowering to um, go from a place of vulnerability to feeling like, oh, this is what they're doing. And seeing supportive comments and suggestions on a daily basis from people who are going through what you're going through, it there's just no words. And mm. the first time you walk into FDRS conference and you're in a room full of lipedema patients and you don't have to explain why standing in line <laughs> is too painful or sitting on a chair with arms is too much because every single one there gets it. And there's, it's just no, it's just powerful. It's just overwhelming. And this community just is so supportive and just continues to get more and more. So. Yeah. It's awesome. Go ahead, Linda Ann. I want to just say something else about the gut issues and the mast cell activation. Many patients have Lyme, have lipid, have Durkheim's disease and may not know that they have it. And then there's mast cell activation that accompanies that, which is very difficult to diagnose. And somebody mentioned Lyme disease, a few of you. I've had, I had four Lyme patients who were sent to me over the years who I actually sent to Dr. Herbst because I felt that they had Durkheim's disease as well, and they did. So oh. there is a crossover and the Durkheim's patients really have big time gut issues and IBS and all the others. So you might want to try and, the problem is who's going to diagnose it, but you might want to find out. And one of the signs of Durkheim's disease is the lipomas are in between the ribs. A lot mm -hmm. of it, it's very, very painful there. And then a lot in the arms. Thank you for elaborating on that too. And Angelique, your head was really nodding about a lot of this stuff. And I feel like I haven't spent enough time with you tonight. What did you want to add to any of this conversation? You know, some of this stuff is just kind of just ringing in for me, um, especially what Patty was just talking about with the community. Um, you know, that first FDRS conference, there really is nothing like being in the presence of other people that are experiencing the same things that you're experiencing. I remember that first time of seeing different assistive devices. One lady had a walking bike and um, another lady had like a wider walker than I had seen before, but it allowed her to actually be able to sit on her seat. Um, so like I, this community is so needed because the rest of the journey before you find the community feels so lonely. You feel like you're the only one who is having these experiences and the doctors look at you like you're a monster. Um, they've already predetermined what you eat. And as we're talking about, a lot of us aren't even able to eat everything that we would want to eat. A lot of us have had to make a lot of modifications to our diet. And in that, there's a struggle in there. It is a struggle to even stay on course. So then you're presented with a medical professional that is judging everything that you do and you're continuously feeling alone. So since people like Patty Cornute have groups that allow us to come together, the FDRS conference, this awesome round table once a month, for some of us, it ended up being our one beacon of hope um, while we were still searching for more answers. Community is like, it's almost all we have for certain is each other. Um, and the community still includes our medical professionals like Linda Ann Conn, like Molly Slay, like Karen Herbst, that are part of us that actually get it and that are fighting for us. So, I mean, I'm totally into this episode today because I'm like, yeah, like it's really all about us actually sticking together. Mm -hmm. Ooh, so I love that. That is so true. Molly, did you want to add something to that? I have a question for everyone. So 
it's so frustrating to really try to find effective ways to educate general practitioners and medical providers that deal on a regular basis with women that have lipedema. So something we've been talking about a lot is what is the best way to do that? How do we drive home all of this information with people or providers that are seeing, you know, patients every 10 minutes? I mean, how do you how do you do that? What is the answer? Does anybody have any ideas? <laughs> because we, I, th I feel like things are moving forward mm -hmm. in terms of being able to identify and diagnose. And as Linda Ann indicated, you know, we're working on some kind of formalized structure of testing, you know, biomarkers, mm -hmm. but how do we educate general practitioners? How do we do that? What is the, what is the solution? It makes me crazy. Well, this is a great conversation and we have five minutes left. So let's round table it real quick. Jenny Bojean. Yeah. And so much to be said, so little time. And I'd like to add on to that, not just get practitioners involved, but get them involved diagnosing people in early stages. Yes. Um, you know, and I start by, before I go to a new physician, I send them the U.S. standard of care ahead of time with a note. And if they read that, that's a start, but that's just one person, one time, but there's, we need a whole episode on this, you know? Uh, oh, all right. Well, producers <laughs> writing notes here, whole episodes, <laughs> but, but the disc, so the patients are empowered with knowledge and gaining more. So every day, the mm -hmm. specialists are already invested. What you're talking Some. about is this middle group of G GPs that could recognize it if they knew about it and they're missing it. And some people are going 40, 50, even 60 years without mm -hmm. being diagnosed, which yeah. we want that to stop. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Patty, go ahead. You have to speak up at your appointments. Mm -hmm. And I know the standard of care is fantastic. I actually like the Lipedema Foundation brochure yep. because mm -hmm. it's really hard to turn down a very colorful brochure that looks just like my body. Mm -hmm. And I have fired doctors. I have walked out mm -hmm. of appointments. I, I just let them know in a very respectful way if they deserve it. But I can mm -hmm. get very you know, short mm -hmm. and just stand up and walk out because mm -hmm. if they don't have your best interest at heart, you're not going to get them to change. You are not going to do it. It's going to take something else. So yeah. standing up for yourself and bringing your, your iPad and showing the groups that you're in and the people that are there. I literally had to show a doctor my videos on my account so that they could see that I wasn't lying about how active I am. Oh my gosh. I get tired looking at your videos because you <laughs> are so active. My goodness. PGP, go ahead as we run out of time. So I agree with Patty about like, if a doctor is not going to help you find a new doctor, we have no problem switching mechanics. If we feel that they're not doing our car right, we need to stop holding doctors, no offense, at such a high level um, that, you know, they know all and start doubting what you know about your body because you know your mm -hmm. body more than they're going to know. And so stand up and I say, if you're not going to help me, you took an oath to do no harm by not helping me. You're doing me a harm. Mm -hmm. So point me to somebody that will, or look at my before and afters. I've told many people show them my Instagram show how surgery has legit changed my life. Show my, how I can walk now show like how I like my eyes are brighter. Like, show use my stuff it's out there for more than just the creepy dudes like use it for help in this community any of the doctors that want to use my stuff reach if you want to use it just add, i can give you the original photos of that are better quality i can give you the videos like i've got it all i was a photographer like i've got it archived i've got it for you i want it out there so everybody can feel the relief that i feel I feel that OBGYNs need educated on it more. I feel pediatricians need educated on it so they can catch it in the, you know, 
the young uh, girls getting it. Yeah. I think that some of the surgeons, and I mentioned this to Dr. Jamie and them, need to advertise on websites that do baby registries and have the period products. If you reg like if you advertise where the women are gonna see it and start to recognize, oh, these are my symptoms, then the women are gonna start talking about it more. Yeah. Add these advocacy groups, if they can help support those kinds of initiatives and in the medical schools, have it taught with the visuals, that would be a game changer. I know that Lympha Press, when our representatives go out and they do in-services with doctors, they're always bringing our lipedema flyers and yeah. showing photos and saying one in 10 or one in 11, whatever the actual statistic is, have this, we sh we need to be treating it. There are effective ways to do so. I want to, did that help at all, Molly? But I think that what we've only done is identified that we all agree. <laughs> that is a gap that needs to be filled. And with some of these advocacy groups, if they can get involved with pushing this agenda forward in the medical schools, I think that would be a tremendous achievement. Final words, PGP. One last thing for like Linda, Ann and them. I think we need to research why the TSA machines shows lipedema and how can we use that to help because it lit up all over when I went out for my first surgery. When I came back from my on my flight home from my first surgery, literally less than a week later, my lower legs didn't light up. Each surgery going out and coming back, the areas Dr. Jamie worked on did not light up on the TSA machine. Wow. I actually walked through on my last surgery coming home and didn't get flagged for a pat down. So wow. we need to figure out how that machine can detect it and nobody else can. That's just my thought. Okay. Maybe <laughs> we need to spend the last 10 minutes of this episode and flood it and make it viral so people will listen. I We're out of time. All I can say is you are all beautiful. <laughs> you have rocked the Oktoberfest here, the Halloween edition. Thank you for being such great sports, Molly and Linda Ann, with your costumes as well, but even more so with your amazing insights and your clinical knowledge. We appreciate it so much. For Angelique and Susie and Kara and Patty and Jenny and from me and Lympha Press, we love you, everybody. Have a great night. Bye. Bye. Thank you.